Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. It's um, an honor to have you here with us, no matter where you are from in the world. And um, I'm certain we'll have more people joining us, but we, we wanna go ahead and start. Tonight, our topic is on the fivefold ministry. And not only in the sense that many of us, um, of course, there are many, many believers, many segments of the church that really don't acknowledge fivefold ministry or what is sometimes referred to as the ascension gifts based on Ephesians chapter four, verse 12, where it says he, meaning the Lord Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, and some to be teachers. So that's the uh, designation of five right there. Uh, what some of us, those of us who do believe wholeheartedly in fivefold ministry, we affirm the office of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, and the pastor and teacher. Um, that's good. But the challenge has been, how do we actually bring the fivefold ministry together so that we collaborate? Rather than just ministering autonomously, doing our own thing, um, how do we actually work together so we complement one another and we actually build up the body of Christ? We had a great session this afternoon for those who are part of our Kingdom Community Network uh, in Europe and also in, um, in, in Africa. Um, we had a, a man of God by the name of Derek Batt from South Africa sharing on the same topic, and he just did a tremendous job looking at how we can actually complement one another. You know, so many times we see this in the body of Christ where there's a competitive spirit, but really the only um, competition that we have is the enemy, is the devil, right? We are called to populate heaven and to plunder hell, as Reinhard Bonnke used to say, and that's our calling. So tonight, we want to look at how do we actually work together to uh, see the fivefold ministry work effectively together, and of course, equipping the saints to be um, conformed to the image and likeness of Christ, to build up the body of, of Christ as well. So um, just before we start, and before I introduce David Balestri tonight, um, we just want to make a couple of quick announcements for those of you who are already part of what we call the kingdom community. Um, you know, we meet together regularly and so on. Well, just because of the very nature that we're growing and more and more people have been reaching out to us and looking for connection and relationship and, and training and equipping still, you know, we've decided to just really um, structure things a little bit more um, conducive to be able to embrace people, to be able to equip and so on. So we've actually put together um, at the beginning stages of a leadership team that is global in nature. And we have a prayer team and my wife Lynn is leading that. And Gloria Saluka from Western Australia has agreed to be part of that team. And we love Gloria. She's like a spiritual daughter to us for sure. And then uh, Donna Thompson from the United States, who is an amazing woman of God intercessor, is also going to be on that team. If you guys are part of the kingdom community and you would like to have um, the team pray for you, I'm going to be praying, obviously, as well. You can send an email to prayer, P-R-A-Y-E-R, at awakenations.org. That's awakenations, plural, dot org. And we will um, we'll get back to you. We're going to be also setting up um, periodically, at least in the beginning, once a month, a prayer room on our private Facebook group. And we'll do that. We'll let you know when it's going to be. And you can pop in and out as your schedule permits. And that will be in our kingdom community. That's a private Facebook group. You will need to request to be part of that. Um, and we'll be having prayer. We also have a care team, and uh, we're pleased to announce that John and Marty Webb will be heading that up. John and Marty have been pastors for years in Western United States. They now live in, in Dallas, Texas, 
and they have been very effective in the area of um, pastoral ministry, seeing people healed, uh, delivered, set free. They have a ministry called Triage Care, Triage Ministries. So they are going to be available to not only help with some training and equipping, but to be available if somebody needs you're just going through a tough time and you just need someone to help you confidentially, they're going to be available to help you. Uh, in addition, just to be able to catch up with some of you guys, you know, just to say, hi, how are you doing? And uh, of course, I'm not talking about in person, but over the over Zoom or however we're going to do that. So it's going to be a great opportunity um, for, for you guys as well to connect with them and to learn and to glean from them and just to know that we are here to help you, to love you, to uh, strengthen you in whatever way we can. This network kingdom community is growing. It's international. More and more people are um, connecting. And, you know, we're just here to really not, not there's no uh, strings attached. Honestly, we're just here to help you. There's no demand for finances. Of course, we appreciate if you support the ministry, it helps us but we don't require that. And um, there's nothing in terms of expectation. We ask you to pray for us, pray for one another, connect with the body of Christ. There'll be opportunities to network, use your gifts, um, on and on. We'll, we'll be going over that in a future time where, where we go into greater depth. If you're not on our email list and you'd like to be added, just go to the website, awakenations. Dot org and you can enter your email address there and you get more information about the kingdom community. Um, also, we have put together what I'm calling basically an equip team. And the equip team is helping me develop resources for training and to think through things. And we've got brilliant men and women from different parts of the globe that are part of that team. So I want to introduce them to you at least by name not everyone who is part of this team is on the call currently but we have uh, Robert Hutapea from Indonesia Joe Denton from Honduras in Central America Derek Bat from um, from basic South Africa from from the Pretoria area uh, Joburg area really uh, Arthur Geis from Chicago Illinois James Park from the Toronto Canada area Kevin Forlong from Queensland, Australia. Edgar Aria from Spain, Southern Spain. We have um, also Daniel, I'm gonna to try to pronounce his name. For those of you who speak Spanish, you can correct me later and teach me. Um, Guerrero, uh, Daniel Guerrero is in Switzerland, uh, originally from Latin America. Um, and Daniel, you guys will be hearing more from him. He's a great man of God. He's been a missionary. Uh, he's written some great books on equipping and training and, and so on. So we're pleased to, to announce uh, this formation of this team that going forward, we'll be helping with teaching, training, um, different aspects, you know, even just in terms of informing the process, um, the, direct, the direction in terms of the materials that we're developing. And so that brings me to July. In July, we're rolling out our training modules. We are going to be offering two sessions once a month. And I believe it's, uh, well, I'll have to give you the date again. Sign up at awakenations.org if you're interested. Or you can message me, private message me. And uh, we'll get you that. But we're going to be teaching from July through December on two topics, the gospel of the kingdom and apostolic centers. We will be rolling out confidentially. You guys are the first to hear this. We're also going to be teaching on um, house churches, uh, you know, the, how to launch a house church movement and so on. So there's going to, to be some more training that's involved in that, but the house church thing will be down the road, not probably not until September or so. Okay. So that's, uh, that's the news. We appreciate you guys getting involved and connecting with us and being part of that. As I said, go to the Kingdom Community private Facebook group. And while you're there, if you'd like to be added to our messenger chat, you can do that. Just request. Um, you can do that. You'll see in the private group or you can message me directly again. Well, we're talking about fivefold ministry 
collaborating, working together, not just recognizing um, and affirming that, but actually how do we see fivefold ministry work together? And I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter four, and it's a very familiar passage of scripture. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation just because it's a little bit of a different perspective on that. The uh, New Living Translation, Ephesians 4. I'm just going to start at verse 11. I know this is not in, in its context entirely uh, in terms of the literary context of this passage. But it says that and these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility, okay, guys, this is on the examination, so um, you, <laughs> their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then verse number 16, he makes the whole body, Jesus makes the whole body um, fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So that is the topic we're going to be looking at tonight. How does the fivefold ministry collaborate, work together to advance the kingdom of God on the earth? And our guest is David Balestri from um, New South Wales, Australia, in the Sydney area. David is the apostolic, he's an apostolic leader in the body of Christ, and he's the convener of the Australian Coalition of Apostolic Leaders. He also works and sits on the national leadership team of the Australian Prophetic Council. David works with senior pastors, networks, organizations in building um, functional and apostolic and prophetic structures and strategies for advancing the kingdom. David's also extensively involved in marketplace ministry and uh, actually runs a ministry that has an impact globally. And you can go to the website to learn more about that. It's marketplaceinvasion.com.au, marketplaceinvasion.com.au. So David, we welcome you to the broadcast or to the Zoom meeting, <laughs> uh, the Kingdom Community. We're so glad that you're here to talk about this topic with us. And uh, just take a moment and just tell us just briefly what is happening in Australia, what the Lord is doing, what you're seeing from your perspective as you labor in uh, the harvest field and in, in the ministry uh, over there in Australia. We'd just love yeah. to hear from you. Sure. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, such an honor to be uh, on this virtual, uh, virtu I'll call it a virtual table, um, uh, late, uh, about October 2019. Uh, I was in Dallas, Texas, near, near where you are there, Glenn. And um, uh, I was at a speaking at the, the Global uh, Apostles Conference, Apostolic Conference for ICAL, for the International yep. Coalition of Apostolic Leaders. And um, I remember I went upstairs after one of the sessions, I went upstairs to the, the global conveners room, John Kelly, great, great apostle, great man of yeah. God. And um, he started talking to me about, uh, would, I, would I take the leader or would I take the leadership of the Australian Coalition of Apostolic mm -hmm. Leaders? And so as we were discussing it, I said to I said to Apostle John, I said to him, uh, I I would consider it, I'd prayerfully consider it. I said to John, but I have a revelation. This is October 2019. I said, I feel like I've got a revelation from the Lord uh, that that in the coming years we're not going to be congregating around conferences uh, so much anymore. Not that we won't have any, but we it it'll no longer be the only, almost the only. Uh, strategy of, um, of, of, of this apostolic message getting out. And I said to uh, John, I said to him, I've got a revelation of tables and councils, not conferences, but tables and councils. So mm -hmm. I said to him, if, 
if, if you make me the leader of the Australian coalition, I'm going to dismantle uh, the conference uh, dynamic of the work. And, uh, and I said, I'm also going to dismantle the, the, the network aspect of the work as far as a network that you join. And I said to him, um, I will only hold it as a coalition of relationships between oh. men and women of God that are aspirational to not just talk about apostolic and prophetic things, but, but to, to put their hand to the plow and actually uh, manifest this dimension that we've been talking about at large now uh, in the body of Christ as a resurgence for the last 25, 30 years. And, right. um, you know, he thought about it for a minute, which I appreciated, <laughs> uh, to consider what I was saying. Uh, right. And he said, he said to me, you know, I've got a witness, Dave, that, that you're on to something and um, I give you full reign to do that. Little did I know, of course, that COVID was around the corner and, you know, the reality of conferences and physical gatherings for the most part were going to be shut down around the globe. But what did transpire, Glenn, was a willingness or a desire amongst uh, my, uh, church leaders to begin to sit at tables of uh, not only conversation, but also considering what does it mean to apostolically collaborate, you, you know, with one another? Like, what does this look like? And, yeah. and to be careful to not think that we've been here before, you, you, you know, to, to go, well, we've, you know, we've done the fraternals, we've done the unity movements, we've Yes, yes, we have. And you know what? There was something that was produced out of those. And we've got to just bring honor to that. So I'm not boohooing that, except to say that what I believe is being charted in front of us, uh, in front of the global church, um, is different. It is, is, is a change, um, a transition, not disconnected from where we've been, but also not limited to those dynamics. And so there's something more on the table. Um, I, I'm, um, I'm convinced, actually, I've got to tell you, I'm convinced that the next 10 years, um, that, as in the 2020 to 2030, are going to set the course, I believe, for potentially the next 100 years uh, for the body of Christ, just like the early 1900s with Azusa Street, the Welsh Revival, set, set really the course of the century of the Holy Spirit in, right. in the outpourings and the charismatic renewal and everything we've seen. I believe that we're at a similar junction here um, that the next 10 years, not so much this thing about the outpouring of the Spirit, but definitely the design, the governmental design and the outworking of how the body of Christ is going to be shaped. I, I find that really interesting because... Uh, uh, it was a couple of weeks ago. I, um, I'm in the marketplace. And so uh, I don't just listen to preachers preaching. I also listen to futurists. And, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm World Economic Forum, I speak into political forums. I speak into business forums. I speak into civic transformational forums, uh, not only here in Australia, but around the world. So I, you know, it's important for me to, um, it, sometimes to, I listen to, as it were, secular uh, futurists, um, not because I need them to teach me something, but it's helpful. Uh, their language is helpful so that when I'm trying to speak kingdom in a, in a, in a, in a political setting, I got language that, that, that the, the marketplace can understand. So I'm not trying to impose church language, churchism into right. it. I can still bring kingdom principle. I just speak it as a futurist. Um, and I, the interesting thing uh, was one of the major futurists that I listened to in Europe there, he was saying that right now with regards to IT, AI, blockchain, supercomputing, he said that all that technology has actually come to a place of maturation where it's no longer conceptual in a laboratory, but now it's about to tip into, and we're seeing it, into real world applications. So he said, we are, we're in a 10, this is what he said. He said, we're in a 10 year window of all this technology that depending on the rules that we place 
to that technology, that's going to determine how that technology outworks itself for the next hundred years. And he used the example of nuclear power or the nuclear science. He said, when the scientists were working on nuclear science, they weren't thinking at this point, they weren't initially thinking about bombs or anything like that. They were just working on the science, right? The opportunity was the nuclear science could then be used for energy, uh, medicine, all these other applications, and also it can be used for weaponry. He said, in this crucial time when that, that technology began to emerge, he said, because the nations were, sub, you know, between World War I and World War II, what happened was the application for nuclear got dominated by the military applications. And he said, as a result of it, whilst it did have applications for energy and other spaces, the dominant expression or the dominant use for that technology sat, unfortunately, in weaponry, right? So right. he says the same thing is now available to us with regards to the tech, with regards to robotics, with regards to AI. And he says, what he was calling for, he says, we need a global council of ethics for, for, um, for technology to be established to sit at the UN that will create a charter of how we're going to embrace this technology into the future. Uh, he said things like the chart. He said he believed the charter should have should have this thing that says we will never allow robotics to become self automating outside of being controlled by by humans. You know that that they can make decision that robotics can make decisions for themselves. You know, like um, I, I I just find that really intriguing because to some degree I think that in the body of Christ we are up. There's a negotiation going on right now. And the, the, the re-emergence by the Spirit of God of the apostle and the prophet and apostolic and prophetic government, it's almost like we also are in this place of negotiation, which is, will we take the revelation of apostles and prophets and their ministries and hammer it back into some sort of a church growth, I don't know, uh, gospel of salvation, sacred secular mold, that we've right. operated in for 50 years, will we hammer it back there? And as a result, I believe, miss a massive window for a surge of the kingdom like we have never seen or like we may have seen before in certain periods of church history. Will, will right. we see that or will we miss it respectfully? I mean, God's patient, yeah. will we miss it? And all of a sudden this, this moment We'll have to return to a future generation because we right. didn't we didn't step up to the plate. So I think this whole discussion about apostles and prophets and fivefold teams and coming together and really figuring this out, um, it's an important discussion. It, it's actually it's it's going to be a wrestle because um, the, implications, cool. the implications the um, implications uh, you know they're really challenging and. Um, we either get a change by revelation or by, you know, persecution. And um, there's no doubt, I don't think anybody here needs to be prophetic to realize that the body of Christ, is particularly over the last 50 years in the Western nations, has moved from favored to exile, right? right. So, yeah. so we, we, without doubt, are in, we've been taken out prophetically, I believe, in the Western nations we, you know, the, the, the dismantling of the judo Christian dynamics and the reconfiguring of everything from sexuality to everything else, right? The, the, the demand for sacred and secular or state and church to be set, all those things are really just uh, are the, is the season of exile. And, and you, we can see that and go, oh my goodness, you know, um, we're in trouble. And, and to some degree, what that's going to mean is certain things are going to collapse that worked for the church that are just right. highly irrelevant. They still got some steam in them, but they're going to run out of steam in at least tw the next 20 years. And it's almost going to be ridiculous that we would continue with some of that strategy. But right. what it also pre presents is a Daniel Joseph Esther moment. <laughs> it, right. it presents a moment and this moment interestingly, 
is the sweet spot for apostles and prophets. I'm not saying we leave pastors, teachers, and evangelists behind. What I'm saying is this moment, I think, is tailor-made so that apostles and the, the, the dimension of Christ that is apostle and prophet can actually shine because we need new world, new era answers uh, that we currently are not producing in the in the major system of, of Christendom that we currently operate in. Right. Yeah. And, you know, we we have people in the world today who have not, uh, you know, shifted with with all of the changes in technology and so on. And, you know, right. I, I, I know someone who's an older gentleman and he still doesn't email. And, you know, I'm just like, wow, I didn't know there were people in the world that don't use email. <laughs> but, you know, email is pretty old school, archaic. But the, the fact is there are still right. people like and the church, there are still many leaders that have not shifted. And not only is um, the traditional, conventional kind of um, what de even denominational paradigm, uh, it's not only in decline, it's in demise. And what's happening, you know, I read a statistic that said when COVID-19 is over um, and the dust is settled here in, in North America, Perhaps right. one third of, of all the churches will be shut down, will be closed. And we're hearing of it all the time. So right. a lot of these churches, for obviously apparent, apparent reasons such as finances, you know, and people not giving and coming and gathering, that type of thing. But what we're seeing, and this is prior, this is pre-COVID-19 as well, is there has been significant decline in the traditional model. Even great Pentecostal charismatic churches that believe in the power of the Holy Spirit have, you know, encounters with God, they're still seeing a significant decline in terms of people that used to attend church. That's, uh, you know, more, more prominent, I think, than North America, than what mm -hmm. I've seen in, in, obviously, in Asia and other places, Africa. But, yeah. you know, that is another, in other words, that's a Western nation phenomenon. But ultimately, things are changing and the church is going through a metamorphosis. And yes. so let's talk about that for a moment, because you talked about this is a, a great time and opportunity yeah. for the yeah. apostle and the prophet to shine. But we still have people that don't understand what you're talking about. So, yeah. so just yeah. to kind of backpedal a bit and just start at the very basics, what sure. role does the apostle and prophet play in this this kind of not only, you know, this is a reformation again, but it's it's a renaissance, really, a rebirthing right. of something completely different, I believe. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, I mean, I think um, just in a macro sense, so for me, uh, when I, as I understand, you know, I've said, people have said around apostle, the, the office of an apostle. And so um, I remember when I first uh, heard the word apostle and I asked, my senior minister, what that meant. He told me that it meant a missionary in a foreign field that plants oh, yeah. churches. That was that was his. Now, the reason that I asked him about it was um, I was in my early 20s and I was reading Ephesians 4. Um, I'd only been saved only a handful of years. And I, I asked the Lord two questions. I said to the Lord, am I one of these five, you know, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist? This is just... This is, an, this is a, like a naive 22-year-old. And I said, look, am I one of these five? And I felt the Lord said, yes, you are. And I said, okay. And I said to the Lord, I mean, by the way, I've never, I haven't, I didn't tell this story for many years until other people began to call me this. And then I said to the Lord, okay, which of the five am I? And I felt the Lord say to me, I'm an apostle. I was going to be an apostle that he called me as an apostle. So I went to my pastor. I didn't tell him any of that. I just yeah. asked a theological question. Because I didn't know. So when he said it was a mission in the Appliance Churches overseas, it confused me first off because I'm a I'm, I'm a kidpreneur. I've been uh, I've been in business since I was ten years old. So I was right. wi I've been I'm wired for business. So it confused me that God was going to send me to the deepest, darkest jungles potentially of Africa or the or the you know the middle of Alaska to plant churches. But I thought whatever you know let's do that. So I actually went and signed up as almost like an apprenticeship in the denomination I was part of, which was the AOG, um, at that time, I, I started making 
And I told my wife, we had two children. I said, well, we're not going to have any more kids because I don't want 10 kids on the mission field. So let's stop with two. And, um, you know, let's start learning how to speak Eskimo or African or something. And so I pursued that for about a year and a half to just not, it didn't gel, you, you know, yeah. it didn't gel in me. So that was the old notion. You know, the, how I would say it today is this, um, apostles are commissioned. And by the way, I believe that maybe this might be controversial, but I believe men and women uh, can be called as apostles, by the way. I believe God looks at the yes, heart. I do too. The, yeah, okay. And, yeah. and so um, I believe an apostle is called to unlock kingdom in a sphere, in a region, and in a people. Now, what that looks like, what that That's looks good. like, the unlocking of kingdom in a, in a sphere of activity, in a, in a ge geography, a geographical, uh, geographical realm, and in a people, what that looks like has multifaceted applications. So maybe unlocking kingdom for this particular apostle might have to do with the strategy of planting churches, planting right. apostolic churches. Okay, I I'm, I'm all for that. But right. what if unlocking kingdom, and say in my degree, I'm actually right. not called to plant churches, sure. but I've launched, I've launched more businesses through kingdom people than most yeah. people that I know. I, I don't say that to boast. I just say that to, to, to share a particular, a peculiar aspect of, um, of that. One of the businesses that I was formative in, right, is in this region, has over 300 staff today. It's only six years old. There's over 300 staff, ministers to over, not only the, the families of the staff, but on top of that with their clientele, another 2,000 families, they, they have three paid intercessors on staff, a wow. paid chaplain on staff. They run, um, they spend several hundred thousand dollars a year on staff training that wow. you and I, anyone here that read the curriculum would understand that this staff training is all wow. kingdom principles, values, uh, dynamics of the kingdom, everything. And then wow. they have a, uh, they actually take their, their entire staff throughout the year, they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this. They take their staff away on two day retreats, like an immersion into kingdom that is that is Babylonian language, but kingdom, right? And then they give them the option of, of they call it next level for their staff, which is where they unpack the whole gospel of the kingdom to them on a separate day and lead their staff and family members to Christ. They, they, wow. they pay for this all the way through. Um, wow. They are, um, as a legacy family, they're one of the biggest givers. Uh, I just, you know, but so all wow. I'm saying to you is, I didn't plant a church. Wow. We planted an enterprise. Right. And that enterprise is expanding the kingdom. Right. right. Wow. Think about that. Yeah. I, um, so so, so, when, so the, the role of an apostle is to release kingdom. The right. application of that will be defined depending on the mandate that the apostle has. The, right. the word, you know, without, because I don't want to teach here, I just want to show example. But, you know, the, one of the words for apostle is apostolos, right? right. And apostolos yeah. in, in Greece, for, for many years, the postal service of Greece was called the apostolos, right? Because it means the mailman, right? It yeah. means the mailman. Apostles carry the mail, the, the, the divine intention of God for a people, place, and a sphere within a particular time. Paul right. carried the mail of God for right. that season of his life as the early church was being expand, expanded. That's, that's what he talks about in the whole book of Ephesians, right? He talks right. about what was downloaded to him. So, so that, to me, is apostolic ministry. Um, yeah. Right. Is, is that all right? Uh, do you want me to go yeah, on no, the I was going to comment on, you know, the, obviously the mail, the mail they would have received back in that time, you know, wouldn't be ad advertisements for something. I mean, these would be messages, important messages, you know, of, co of value and content. And, right. and so you know, I, when you look at that in terms of the revelation that's imparted from an apostle, it's, that's brilliant. Yeah. That's great. Thank yeah. you. Which is, which is powerful when, when that dimension, which you've spoken about in Ephesians 4, that dimension is never supposed to be just held with inside the apostle. 
It's supposed right. to be imparted into the saints so that, that that ability of the saints to download the mail of God for their right. enterprises, for their workplaces, the revelation of God of how do I bring kingdom into my workplace, into my school, into my that's factory that. setting? Like that's the apostolic dimension that's supposed to come inside of the saints as a result of apostolic ministry. Like that's right. that's what everybody wants. We we want that. Right. So so let's just move for a second to profit. Okay. I I think that I think that we we're in um, we're in an interesting time. I think that that the initial thrust of the resurgence of the office of the prophet, which precedes the 80s. I know a lot of people talk about the 80s, but come on, the latter rain boys and some of the other guys, even, even denominationally, the apostolics had, were really Absolutely. championing, you know, uh, here in, in Australia the 20- in the 1960s, you've got yeah. the apostolics trying to figure out how to functionally operate with right. apostles and prophets working together. Their, yeah. their well, era... You know, Yep. I was just going to say the church that I pastored in Perth, oh, yeah. that church was uh, came out of the first church that was started in Australia by the apostolics that came oh. out of the West Revival. West Revival, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. First yeah. one, they That's... came to Perth first, did a That's miracle, right. yeah, healing the sick and so on. And then they, they planted, and of course, they were operating that yeah. way in terms of apostles and prophets. Yeah. Yeah. So I yeah. Um... Absolutely. I they mean, the era in which... the 1920s and the 1920s and, and oh, you know, Wales and England and so on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the era, which is the era all the time, is the moment that you, the moment you turn these, these graces into hierarchies, you, yes. you're always, you always infect it and you kill it right. to, to some degree. Um, my spiritual father uh, in the 1990s and, and early 2000s until he went on to be with the Lord was a guy called Ray McMartin from the apostolic denomination. And um, he was an absolute, he was a fathering, uh, like a real pastoral apostle. And um, he, in the early days, I, I functioned as a prophet beside him because he he had a pattern inside of him that, and, a, and the apostolics believed that if, if you were an apostle, you had to have really a prophet on at your side. You couldn't, you couldn't just right. operate outside of them. Now, their right. understanding of the office of the prophet, I think, right. was still a little bit, a, a little bit challenged, a little bit. Um, there was a, there was a, some mixture there, um, but but it, but it was better than what most people, most apostles and prophets weren't talking to each other back right. then. You know, they were competing right. with each other because they didn't understand yeah. what role they had. So yeah. the office of a prophet. So, you know, the office of a prophet, I think, has been highly confused in the body of Christ for at least right. 20, 20 to 25 years. And what we've done is we have promoted people that have gifts of the prophetic, particularly word of wisdom, word of knowledge. And we've, uh, uh, and we've promoted yeah. those people as prophets and we've hurt them. And as a result of it, we've confused the body with regards yeah. to what is a Ephesians 4 prophet, not a 1 Corinthians 12 or 14 uh, gift of prophet, prophecy. Uh, right. We confuse that. And so for, for the most part, I don't think most people understand what is an Ephesians 4 prophet. An Ephesians 4 prophet is, first of all, that's a leadership dimension in the body of Christ. So you can't be an Ephesians 4 prophet and not be the leader of anything. Can't be leading. You might be emerging, but but right. but you definitely because you own a website and a Facebook page and you send out a blog once a day doesn't make you an Ephesians four prophet. If exactly. if 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 you're not a, if you're not within a leadership dynamic, particularly within a fivefold team. But right. a prophet, a prophet, uh, an Ephesians four prophet is uh, has a similar role then a similar and different role than the Old Testament prophets. The similarity is in the Old Testament, the prophets operated as covenant lawyers, right? They, they, they had this ability, this, this revelation of where God was, where his people were, and what covenant they were in, and, and if that was in alignment. And the moment, because yeah. God never comes out of, of course, the covenant, he always operates right. in the covenant that he's in, but when the right. people of God would move away or wane or try and renegotiate in their hearts this covenant that they were in with God, 
the prophet's job was always to help the people locate God, understand where they were, and call them back into alignment, right? If you, if you think yeah. about it like that. In a okay. New Testament sense, in the New Covenant sense, the role of the prophet is the same. One of the primary roles of a New Testament prophet is to know where God is, understand the covenant we're in. That's why prophets should absolutely be, be planted in the word. I mean, the, the notion that prophets are highly planted in ethereal realms with no anchoring in great theology and revelation is ludicrous. How can you, right. how can, how can you be a covenant lawyer and you, you don't even understand the covenant of grace right. that, you, that we're under? So, so in many respects, the role of a prophet is to continue to call the body of Christ into alignment to the covenant that they're in and to warn the body when they're coming out of that covenant or when, they, when they're renegotiating it or waning it or compromising it so that the role of a New Testament prophet is correctional. Um, it has exhortation, edification and comfort, but they're not so, limited. Prophetic ministry is limited to those realms, but the office of the prophet is not. They, they operate in that. They operate with the heart of the father, um, but, but, but they're more than that. Also, the office of a New Testament prophet is heavily invested in the flow of the spirit of God in the earth, heavily invested in that. To many degrees, they are through their prophetic abilities able to unlock, as it were, the flow of the spirit of God in a region, in a place, in a time, uh, right, for a context. And to many degrees, prophets bring the river of God. If you think about it this way, prophets bring the river of God, apostles, help prophets to create the banks, the, 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 the architecture that the river can flow well so that it can be channeled well. When a prophet doesn't right. stand next to an apostle appropriately, sometimes that prophet will flood everything and everyone drowns. When an right. apostle doesn't stand near prophets or work well with prophets, what they do instead of creating these, these wonderful boundaries, they create a dam and they block everything up with overstructuring things, right? So there's, and they, they miss potentially some of the timings of God, not the ways of God. Apostles are great at seeing land. Uh, prophets are great at seeing heart, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so that's, that's yeah. to me, a bit of a defining of, of those two ministries. And that's great because you, you, know, you touched on obviously how, how they work together in tandem. And yeah. the truth is, we, I, I really believe when we look at this, you know, like without saying any specific names of organizations sure. or whatever, sure. there, there's movements that emphasize the prophetic, yeah. uh, you know, the mm -hmm. people that gather together. And as you said, many of them operate in the gift of prophecy, but not in the office of a prophet. Um, mm -hmm. just, just a side note, um, Agabus according to history, and, and just for those who are listening, according to history, was one of the 70 that Jesus sent out, and he also was one of the elders in the church in Jerusalem. So right. that's powerful, guys. He wasn't just some mm. guy going around prophesying wherever he wanted. So, so that relationship with the apostles, that connection was there. Um, but in terms of, you've got that extreme, and then you have the those who are all apostles getting together, and and this is just uh, recently myself and, a, and another apostle, actually, we were talking about this. We said, we've been part of those meetings and it's all about strategy, developing mm -hmm. strategies. And we've just, and they cut off the flow of the Holy Spirit. There's right. very little talk about the supernatural and the power of God, you know. And of course, I love Acts 19 when Paul went to Ephesus and there's so much in that passage of scripture, <laughs> but uh, undeniably the, the supernatural dimension of, of heaven coming to earth and the power of God with miracle signs and wonders uh, yeah. was so, so evident. And, and it was, it's the norm in, in uh, the New Testament. Yes, uh, absolutely. absolutely. So, yeah. so how do we uh, bring, especially when you talk about apostles and prophets in this season, uh, where things are changing, 
so much. Um, you know, how do we how do we bring the body of Christ along with us, so to speak? And yeah. and I, I love, you know, that we still have people that use the language of the sacred and the secular and marketplace and ministry, church ministry versus marketplace. We have to we have to get rid of that dichotomy. You know, those lines uh, need to be removed, erased. And ministry is ministry, whether you're in the marketplace right or you're ministering in a church, like you said, planting churches. So what I hear you say um, is an apostle could be uh, assigned to a, a geographical location, a sphere and a people. And that sphere, for example, could be marketplace. Um, yes. But yeah, but see, there's a lot of people that would say, well, an apostle has to be in a church or perhaps he's itinerant or he oversees a network. But they don't see that, um, and yeah. I think that's yeah. that's part of the the process here, the transition. We're still kind of we're not fully yeah. there yet. True, yeah, true, true. Yeah. What if what if what if uh, so? If someone said to me, David, but doesn't an apostle need to be an apostle in the church? And I would say, I would say, okay, yes, I agree with you. I just think your concept of church is too small. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Right, <laughs> because because if you're saying to me, if you're saying church in the sense of building, the building. on the corner, then I'm going to say to you, that's not big enough. That's that's right. not the four walls of the church. I right. I think I think you know the Catholics had it to some degree where every priest believed that the city was their parish. Yes, like just think I'm, about that for a minute. Right, that's that's pretty apostolic. That's that's yeah. the Catholics used to understand that. So. I think that that we've been so conditioned local church that when right. look most most apostles are terrible in local church ministry. <laughs> they they're too boisterous. They muck everything up. The the people are yeah. frustrated. The the people are tired because the apostles always taking land, taking land, taking land, and the, the right. sheep want to eat grass in the corner. You know, like I, right. I remember with with Pastor Ray. Um, I remember that, you know, sometimes when he wouldn't travel, I'd travel with him a lot. When he wouldn't travel for a couple of months, his wife would say to him, don't you have an invitation to go somewhere? Like, like, yeah. you know, we're all tired, Ray. Just leave us, okay. al leave us alone. Right. And right. so, so I just think, um, I think it is a radical look. It, it's going to, I'm respectful. It's going to take, um, it's going to take us years to really get comfortable with the notion that an ascension ministry, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, or evangelist could potentially not be the senior minister of a local church or have a network of churches or an itinerant ministry to churches. One of the, one of the most uh, anointed pastors listen to this ascension pastors that i know actually pastors a city he pastors the mayor he pastors the police force he passed right. like you know now yes he's a civic like he, he loves the civic thing and injustice he's working to you know all these so he's a transformational guy but ah oh, man I, I mean i could tell you stories i could I, let me give you this one so i won't tell you where this guy's from because just to protect him so one of my consultancy clients, I consult to a guy who I would say would be one of the dominant apostle in his country. But he, this guy doesn't run a church. He owns the second largest agricultural business in that, in that nation. Actually, his competitor is the prime minister, believe it or not. Um, and this guy, this guy um, is working with a team of four others. One of them is a transformational pastor. The other one is an intercessor, like a, a, a head intercessor. Another one is a guy that is um, establishing uh, uh, houses of worship, like Davidic worship throughout the nation. And the fourth person that he's working with is a Catholic politician who's an economist who carries a prophetic word that this, this guy will become the future prime minister of his nation. And my guy, my, the, the apostolic guy, he's a business guy, he is the influence and the bank. He's the money, right? He's an apostle. And they have an absolute 20 year vision to see that nation that they're a part of, which is not a godly nation today, transformed through multiple strategies that doesn't leave the 
formal church behind, right. he's just he's just not going to operate within the parameters of church conferencism or church plantism. He's not going to do that. Do, do you know, one of the things that this guy did in the early 2000s, uh, long story, but the long story short was he connected a transformational guy that had a real passion to uh, create uh, life centers for like rehab centers for disenfranchised youth and that sort of thing. And through a series of providential events, he was able to buy, listen to this, the abandoned concentration camps in his nation, buy them off the government and refit them out to become these life centers of renewal for the youth in his nation. And it's not a pastor of a church at all. That, that's an apostolic work. I mean, I'm telling you, it's an apostolic work. And I've just told you like one slither of wow. this guy's story, you know. So I, I, I don't know, Glenn, I just think, I think we will hurt ourselves if we try and put apostles in this ecclesiastical box that we've, we've become familiar with over the sure. last hundred years. But to be right. truthful, come on, um, church history, if you understand church history, you'll know many apostles launched out and created pathways into medicine and science and, right. and art. Right. I mean, Francis Schaeffer wrote a great book about the church, why the church threw the arts away when we were the apostolic leaders of the arts in the earth, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah you, got me fired, of, you got me fired up. Yeah, and a lot of the social justice stuff, uh, you know, here in the United States in particular, the YMCA, the YWCA, right. John Howard Society, all of these, even the major universities were started by Christians and, you know, very much involved in wanting to see um, the, uh, the mindset and the transformation. So, so yeah. here, one thing I just want to touch on now, because I think you, you just kind of, you went there, but I'd like to go there. Uh, okay. Let's take it, let's just even take a deep dive into this right now. Now, when we talk about the typical traditional paradigm of church, like you said, okay. and we define church as the building, as the place we go to worship God or maybe be trained right. or equipped, um, when we define it the New Testament way, obviously, is the ecclesia and, and the people of God who are in a location in a city, we are the church. Well, look, Paul said we're the temple, right? And yeah. in the temple, I love uh, Paul's Ephesians, uh, particularly when you read it in the Amplified Bible and the classic, he talks about how the fullness of God dwells in his body. Mm. And, and so as we come together as a body, that's the important part. You know, recently the Lord's been highlighting for me, Ezekiel 37, when you see all these bones scattered, very dry, and they're disconnected. And when the prophetic uh, voice sounded, you know, then the first thing that happened was the bones came together. So there was a formation of structure of body. Yeah. And that body, of course, represents the people of God. And then once the structure came together, then we see the, the wind or the breath of God, the spirit right. of God poured out. Right. And a lot right. of people, we emphasize revival. Um, we have these mm -hmm. guys that are revivalists and I, and I believe in, there are people that have that calling, yeah. obviously, yeah, absolutely. Definitely, definitely. But, but in terms of the five folds, you know, uh, revivalist is, where does that fit? And then, and then ultimately we have a lot of guys that are just kind of doing the revivalist thing. But then when we bring it together with the apostolic, with the prophetic and, and then even the other five fold then we see that this is actually producing structure and spirit. So right. when, when we see this, what God is trying to do is to bring together a body that actually um, represents him, that is the fullness of who he is in nations, to the nations, because the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And it will be through the church, released through through the church, not a church building, not church services, not even church ministries, but through the people of God. And so that to me is really important. So let's talk about the gospel of the kingdom. Yeah. If some people, when you say, I'm writing a book right now on that, 
And when people talk about the gospel of the kingdom, they'll say, oh, well, the gospel of the kingdom, you know, the kingdom of God is not in word, it's in power. So they'll say the gospel of the kingdom is the full gospel. It's not just preaching, but it's signs and wonders, it's miracles. Uh, I think it's much more than that. What are your thoughts? What is yeah, the gospel? Yeah. Well, I think this is an important point, especially like, so we're talking about uh, the collaboration between apostles and prophets, right? Yeah. But the problem is, even if, if, if that was, if we had that together, but let's right. say, let's say apostles and prophets were working together, but, but then let's say that their concept of the gospel was limited, then you've still got a problem, right? So you, you, you uh, need, we need, we need to have the kingdom understood and defined. I think I just put it this, this way. Look, is the cross, is, is Jesus's work on the cross limited to salvation of men, of men and women? So is it salvitic only? Right. Or is the work of the cross not only salvitic, but cosmological? In other words, are the implications of the cross, I'm talking about this side of eternity, by the way. So, so, so from the work of the cross now, the age that we're in now, is the implications of the cross purely salvitic, the salvation of people to get them to an eternal destination, or is the work of the cross cosmological in that includes salvation, but also includes the restoration of the created order back into alignment to what God purposed when he in Genesis 1, right? So that's the question. So some people say to me, I, I'm obviously prejudiced, and I go, look, I believe it's cosmological. It includes the salvation of humanity, but I also believe that it's the reconciliation of all things, right? That, that the God was in Christ reconciling not only all people, but all things. And I right. don't just mean that all things in the at the end when, when Christ comes to consummate uh, the kingdom that he inaugurated at the cross, right? So, well, inaugurated at the beginning of his ministry. So, so here's the question. So, so some people say to me, Dave, you're overreaching when you, when you suggest that. And you suggest that God also not only wants to save people, but he wants to disciple nations, that he wants to disciple cultures and, and organizations and even spheres, right? right? And I say right. to them, okay, okay. And even, I mean, I think this has implications to, to, um, I think this has implications to the earth, the natural earth as we know it, you know? And so here's what I said to them. I said, to them, okay, so let's go to Genesis three and talk about the implications of sin. Oh. Let's talk about the implications of sin. Were the implications of sin, did it only affect human beings? Did it only affect Adam and Eve and their children? Or oh. would you say that the effects of sin also touched the disruption of creation as we know it? And right. most people, if they were just sincere, would say, of course, sin affected everything, right? Including the cosmos. And I just go, so are you saying to me that Adam's sin, Adam's act of sin is more powerful than Christ's work of redemption? Is that what you're saying to me? Because you're right. saying that Adam blew all this up, but in Christ, this is restored until fundamentally the end. When Adam sinned, the implications of his sin did not begin in eternity, like at the end of the age in eternity. They were immediate. They were in the earth. So Christ's redemption that is in the earth, that happened in the earth, has implications immediately for the earth. Now, in an ultimate sense, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. with you. It's it's progressive. I'm I'm not a I'm not a I'm not a you know dominionist in an ultimate sense or triumphalistic in you know, right. um, I'm not going to go into that error, but but what I'm saying to you, so who decides how much of it gets redeemed? I, right. I think the church does. Right. <laughs> I think I think the church in each generation gets to decide how much of the kingdom actually becomes established in the earth. I think, Absolutely. I, I, I think the church picks that. And to the degree that we're in alignment to the kingdom, the degree that we're in order around the fivefold, Right, and to the degree that we have the saints activated in their ministry roles, which because right. here's the thing, as far as redeeming the earth, that's the job of the saints, right? Not the church leaders, like yes. like, like 
if you think about who's at the coalface, it's not the church pastor on his pulpit on a Sunday speaking the sermon. Like he's an equipper. Yeah, he's do but the coalface people is the lady working in the government offices in lo your local region in an administration role. The school teacher working in the public school, the 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 the, the entrepreneur, um, you know, with his landscaping business, he and she and they are at the coalface of this gospel of the kingdom. I mean, they're the Davids in the field, to be truthful. <laughs> sure. you know? Absolutely. So yeah. that's kind of where, that's how I capture it from a kingdom perspective. That's great. Yeah. And just to add to what you're saying, you know, the scripture says in Psalm 115, 16, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he's given to the children right. of God, sons of men. So that's, you know, in the beginning, obviously, that was what Adam and Eve, Adam was given that authority. And yes. I, I refer to Luke 19, 10, that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And yeah, yeah. some modern translations say basically those who are lost. But when you really look it up in the Greek, that's not what it says. It says that something impersonal, which was lost. What right. that in Greek, it's literally, it's literally that uh, having been lost is what it says right. in Greek. So, so the idea is we are coming to redeem that. And when you read the book of Acts, there are these examples where we see cities being shaken by the power right. of God and right. by the apostles. They moved in such power and authority. And then after that, of course, the process of discipleship, and you know, we we refer to it as the the whole invade, occupy, and transform, which the Romans sure. did in a territory. So yeah. the now I want people just to be clear that we're not talking here strictly on social transformation. Mm -hmm. No, uh, we're not saying we just need to you know get deal with poverty, deal with injustice, yeah, yeah. deal with yeah. all these things. Uh, people need to get, they need Christ. They need to be they born again. That's, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. But our, our calling is to bring change to the earth and, and the people and the earth. And, and that's an important distinction. Ultimately, we know when Jesus returns, the final enemy sure. to be defeated is death. But everything you read talks about a present reign. Revelation yeah. 5, 10. Uh, he and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. That yes. uh, speaks of reigning now and continuing yes. in the present yes. tense. So, yes. so there is that reigning that's bringing change and transformation to the earth, rather than just getting people into a church building, preach the gospel to them, get them saved so they can go to heaven. You know, the the bringing the kingdom to the earth. Jesus said, "Preach the kingdom." And people literally move from out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of, of his own son, Colossians 1.13. So, so um, for those, let, let just one final thought, David. For sure. those who are actively involved in, um, you know, this, they have a kingdom mindset, they have a, a vision for the kingdom. You know, we have people that are on the Zoom meeting and many people that will watch the replay that, Right. They they're not necessarily pastoring a church. Um, they're not necessarily itinerant, but they really have a kingdom perspective. How do we bring all of this together and and just fulfill the mandate of Jesus Christ? Yeah. You know what? Mm. I, I'm not asking you for a strategy or formula. But no, I'm just no, saying, no, I, I hear. I hear. I Does everybody one seem of the... to be doing their own little thing? You know, I'm saying we. And, and there's yeah. something wrong with that, and maybe maybe that's part of it. We, but how can we move beyond the church yeah. is doing its thing, the guy is doing, you know, yeah. he, the businessman is doing his thing, the yeah. doctor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's got to begin. It's got to begin inside. It's got to be a revelation inside the heart of the individual. Like that's fundamentally, this is where it's got to start because because it, you know we can complain and put up a whole bunch of I would find a lot of angry Christians on social media trying to tell trying to tell the church all the all the places that she's ugly you know and and yeah. I, I'm, I'm always a little cautious about that I mean sometimes I'll do something 
to be right. provocative because everyone's just playing so nice and, you know, but, but, you know, I just think to myself, look, the good news is this, that especially with this message of the kingdom is Jesus said the kingdom doesn't come by your observation. It really is an internal job. It begins as an internal revelation. And what happens is when you allow that revelation to capture you, it will begin to change a whole bunch of things in you. Hopefully, it'll deliver you from your selfishness, and hopefully it'll deliver you from your sectarianism. Hopefully, it'll deliver you from the shallowness of your understanding of you and your tribe alone. And all of a sudden, you begin to fall in love with and get a vision of the church in the city, of the body of Christ, of God's big plan for the earth. And then you've got to find yourself and you've got to say, God, in the midst of it, by your spirit, what's my part to do that? I think what happens is like it's a process of I, 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 the, the, the message of the kingdom and the anointing of the kingdom. And the, it, it, it's a process of deliverance, can I say, in some degree. And all of a sudden, how do you know it's working? You won't be able to read your Bible the same way because your prejudices begin to fall. And all of a sudden, the, the word of God that you've been reading for whatever, 18, 20 years, you read it and it's like you've never read the book of Acts before. Right. And, yeah. and not only that, then you, you see things on television or you, you, you go into your workplace and your eyes are different. Um, I, I used to work for a multinational company that, that had a toxic work environment, unionized, really money hungry, all this sort of stuff. I used to complain to God every day when I walked in there. I used to say to God, why have you put me in Joseph's dungeon? You know, like, get me out of here. You know, I used to say to God, I'm ready for the palace. Get me out of here. So I remember one day I'm complaining in the car park. Now, I was, a, I was like a, a middle manager in this organization. So, you know, I mean, so I'm in the car park complaining to God. God, I'm here again. When are you going to release me to the call of ministry? When are you going to release me? And I remember the Lord rebuked me in the car, like in, in the car park right then and there. And the Lord said to me, Dave, when you stop complaining, we're going to get on with what needs to happen here. And I said, well, now I'm, he's got my attention because it's like God's challenge. And I said to God, so what's going to happen here? He said, I've brought you here every day to be a conduit of my kingdom. And all you do is complain and shut the kingdom inside of you. And he said to me, I remember the Lord said to me, the kingdom that you walk into there, which is Babylon, is it greater than the kingdom that I placed inside of you? And I said, no, Lord, I carry the dominant kingdom. Now, here's what I heard the Spirit of God say. I heard the Spirit of God say, then go and become the dominant principality in your work environment. Awesome. <laughs> go and become the dominant principality, the principality of the kingdom, and displace the one there. Do you know, that set me on a course. And um, what happened? I mean, miracles happened. All of a sudden, I, I, was, I was given favor to rescript the entire management training program for that multinational company. I built a two-day program. It wasn't even my job. I built it, they gave it to me because I was getting the best results out of the workers because I was, I was practicing kingdom principles of yeah. honor, respect, uh, treating them as humans. Like it, I ended up writing a two-day training program that now all their managers have to go through. And I can say to you on this call, it is kingdom all the way. I just stripped out the scriptures. So now right. we've got the Babylonians using my kingdom manual of management to, sure. to induct them into a multinational uh, yeah. um, company. You, you get what I'm saying? So all of a awesome. sudden, I, I just think that gives people a future wherever they are. You are the custo You're the carrier of the kingdom. If you'll just agree with that, if you'll, right. if you'll say, yes, Lord, now teach me how to do that. I think yes. as far as strategies and plans, Glenn, that that's that's going to come. It'll come. It'll come. You know. That, that's brilliant. Thank you. And it's so true. Look, that was just full of, of uh, really heavy <laughs> revelation <laughs> right there. Um, it's so true that we are called to be the dominant principality wherever we go. So that, thank you yeah. for that. Um, so, guys, we want to just obviously give you a, a moment to respond to what David shared. Um, some of you guys 
from different parts of the world, it's important to, to use titles. So I'm going to call you Apostle David. Um, and in other parts of the world, especially Australia, it's not so important. But uh, just one of the things I, I throw out is the question is what specifically um, the one takeaway that you got from this for you guys, just type it in the chat. What was the, you know, something that really stuck out with you, a, a revelation that you received today? Just type that in the chat. And then the other question is, um, what are you going to do with what you heard today? What, what, what's one thing you can do? Just go ahead, type that in the chat as well. And then one question for David. We'll take maybe two or three questions if you have time, David. Sure, um, sure, yeah, yeah, no, I'm good. I'm, yep. Okay, so we'll we'll just take about ten minutes longer. So go, go ahead, ahead, guys. If you have um, a particular uh, question as well, just go ahead, and we want to make sure that would be uh, that would be you know something you get the opportunity. So what's the one takeaway? What what have you? What are you going to do with what was shared today, the information? Um, so, Richard, very inspiring. Many thanks. Reminder to release who, what is inside of me, not what is in my head. Great. Uh, this has been one of the best discussions I've ever heard on the kingdom. Thank you, Apostle David and Glenn. Great. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yes. Can, can I just respond to that for a moment? Thank yes, you, sir. Kevin. Um, you don't know this. I was a very young man when I first met you in a revival meeting. And, uh, wow. and um, yeah, I have great, great respect for everything that you've done. And just to, to see you online today, I was actually very, I was a little, a little scared, thought I oh, don't stuff it up, Dave, uh, Pastor Kevin's on <laughs> <laughs> online, but just thank you. Thank you. That really does mean a lot um, right. from someone who I know uh, is of your caliber. That, that means a lot. I really respect that. Right. Absolutely. And we're so honored to have Kevin as part of uh, the team here. He's been contributing and doing a lot of the teaching and equipping to a good personal friend of ours as well. We just love him. Mm. Um, he's a great man. Of God. So guys, any particular questions, keep the comments coming. Um, David referred, referenced the impression the church would be moving away from conferences, um, tables and councils. I really bear witness. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. um yeah great great there, comments there's just, just things there's just things that that can happen around like a virtual table and a physical table like this and at a you know the difference i would just say is tables are like this where we're kind of extrapolating councils become more strategic moments mm -hmm. where the outworking of what happened at the table you get to that jerusalem council it seemed good to us in light of the revelation right. that's coming out of the tables it seemed good to us that this might be the way forward. So, um, yeah, I think at conferences, conferences are wonderful for inspiration, but not a lot of conferring happens at conferences this, these days. Um, it's usually just a, a bit of a preach fest, believe it or not. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, okay, one comment, mind-blowing, so much appreciated. My top take was about being a principality in our sphere, Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. One question I have is, can there be a hybridizing of ascension gifts? For example, can you be an yeah. apostle slash prophet or? Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, I, they, I mean, Wag, Wagner wrestled with this a lot in a lot of his, yeah. his writings. And, and I probably agree with, with his, at the end of the day, the bottom line, he said, of course, someone can, can operate strongly in both say at the office of a prophet uh, or the a prophet and an apostle. And which I probably would witness to that for myself. However, one of those gracings would, would, would be the dominant, the dominant gracing, would be the peculiar gracing. And then so you can have an apostle who's also a very strong prophetic gift. But um, but I, I don't think I don't I don't see uh, that people carry like, oh, I'm a I'm an ascension evangelist and I'm an ascension teacher. I, I think you can have a teaching evangelist or an evangelistic teacher. So one of those gracings will become the dominant base gracing. It's important to know that because right. it also speaks to the peculiarity of your assignment. And then there can be a strong secondary, even third gracing on uh, on 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 it. So on on the person. So that that's how I would capture that. Yeah, that's great. And you know there there are those who would also say that particularly the office of the apostle is you know they flow in in all five but the dominant obviously is the apostle there's times when you 
right. kind of touch on that. But I, I agree. I think, I think, you know, just knowing myself, I know my dominant yeah. gifting, then there's, there's two other giftings right. that are quite strong as well in terms of the fivefold. So, but yeah, that's yeah. great. Okay. Uh, comment here. We have to bring revelation in this move. I heard the words revelation or decimation. If we don't move in the present revelation, being the perspective would cause decimation, which is a drastic reduction in the strength or effectiveness of the body of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. someone else just commented on, uh, while we may not set out to leave the church behind, we might pray that the church does not leave itself behind. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to have, you're going to have every move of God, every restoration carries a dimension of vanguards and mavericks. It's, 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 it's what needs to happen. I mean, the, Jesus was a maverick and a vanguard. If you think about it, so were the apostles. And so it, you know, the thing about it is I think how God prepares us to, for that is right. I, I really love the church. I like, I I'm telling you, I, when I was, as a young man, I used to pray for power. I used to pray, God, give me your power. And um, I heard the Holy Spirit arrest me one day and say to me, I'm not going to do it. And I said, of course, you're going to do it. You, that's what you do. You, 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 okay. Holy Spirit, you, and I, I felt Holy Spirit said, I'm not going to do it until you ask me to give you my love for my body. Cause okay. you with power without loving my body, like I love it will hurt my body with my power, you know? Right. And um, so, so, uh, yes, you know, it's hard sometimes it, it, people get upset when you, because they, they'll, people accuse me to go, oh, you're just trying to dismantle, you know, you, you're negative against, I, no, I love the church. I love, I love, I love the church. Oh man, I do. I just, just like I love my kids. And if I see my kids doing something that limits them, I'm, and I can see a better way forward, I'm going to champion that way forward. Not because I don't love them, you know. Right but because there's a better way. And I think that that's what, that's what the Holy Spirit's leading us into in this time. Yeah, no, that's great. That's, and you know, again, it really, when you talk about loving in the church, of course, the problem is that we, we have this too narrow of a definition of the church, you know, and of course we love the gathering of the saints to worship the Lord, to, to pray, preaching and teaching. That's so important, but that it in itself is not the church churches you know, much much more than that so absolutely and and mm. it's so good that you said that because there are many uh right now who who have that attitude unfortunately you know well i had a bad experience i'm not going to yeah. be part of yeah that. and and uh, you know we work with people that are that have house churches and that's one of the things we make sure is that that spirit right. is prevalent yeah so yeah. the body of Christ is his bride and we are part yeah. of it. So. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Well, thank you for sharing that. One last question. Is there someone who has uh, one, one last question we'll take while uh, you're typing away? Let me just say thank you guys for joining. And again, if you'd like to receive our updates, um, we have a great session coming up in early July where we have a prophet who will be joining us, who will be just ministering, um, talking a bit about um, the, the office of the prophet and the prophetic and how it fits in to this season in particular in the body of Christ, but also doing some ministry and uh, just a night of really encouragement. Um, so that's coming up. If you want to know, go to awakenations.org and enter your email address and we'll, we'll get a hold of you guys and give you updates. Kingdom Community Facebook group. You can join that as well. We have information there. And David, how do people uh, learn more about what you're doing? Yeah, um, look, the easiest way, I'm, I'm pretty active on Facebook and Instagram. So just my name, um, you know, I've got some websites, but if you just, if you link to me on, on social media and just ask me, I can send you those links. Um, I throw a bunch of stuff up on YouTube. Uh, for free, just videos of of some of this, especially the marketplace stuff. You you know, it's 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 something that most people don't hear in their churches a lot. Um, so I do that as just uh, really trying to get. I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm just trying to get the message out there. Um, you know, as much as I possibly can. So social media, Google my name into YouTube, and you'll find a bunch of stuff there as well. And 
then you know most of that stuff will have links to my um, my websites. I do uh, newpropheticdimension.com is one of my websites. The marketplaceinvasion.com.au is another. I actually I run a consultancy business called Elite Human Development, um, which is my my personal consultancy. I, I consult with kingdom business people, um, Australia, New Zealand, and then throughout Europe and America as well. So it's all around the world now. And, um, you know, that's a bit more specialized and, uh, you know, so they're, they're kind of the different channels you can, you can reach out to me through. Right. Well, so that's awesome. Know. Great. Uh, incredible. Thank you so much. What an incredible session. We really appreciate your time, and what you've imparted. Um, amazing. You know, I know a lot of people are going to be talking. This video will be uh, watched <laughs> over mm -hmm. and over again. I know that for a fact. Right. Right. So. Thank you for your time and your servant's heart. We really appreciate it, Dave. And I mean, yes. let's just pray for let's just pray for Apostle David right now. Lord, we just mm -hmm. thank you for your servant. We thank you thank for you. what you have called him to do. And we know, Lord God, that he is in a season, Lord, where he is um, seeing much fruit. Lord, I just thank you that this is a season of convergence for him, Lord, yes. where things are coming together and doors are opening, Lord. And I just pray, Father, that mm. you would just uh, continue to to give him the wisdom, and the grace, uh, and the discernment, Father, that he needs, the the judgment, Lord, to to be able to walk in a way uh, that he's truly following you, Lord. So we thank you, and we speak a blessing over his life, his family. His ministry, Lord God, in all the different facets of ministry, Lord, the apostolic, the prophetic, the marketplace, and consulting, and so on. Lord, we thank you for that, and we just give you glory and honor. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your servant um, in the name of Jesus, and we, we give you glory, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much for your prayers. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll look forward to hearing from you again. Yes. And uh, bless you guys. Uh, all you Aussies over there, we bless you guys. We miss you heaps. Uh, <laughs> I <laughs> want to come back, but it doesn't sound like the borders are going to be opening anytime soon. But <laughs> anyway, all right. Thank you. Have a good night or good day, everyone. Blessings.